So I'll start now. A very good evening to all of you. And thank you for joining on this lovely Saturday evening. I have with me experts in the area of distance education, homeschooling, education world, and those who are setting up modern educational institutions. I will do injustice to the, to the experts if I introduce them myself. So I will allow them to introduce them themselves. But before I get down to allowing them to introduce, I will just set the context for this webinar. So I'm going to start off with a little history here, going back into education. So let's, you know, when did education start? I think it started the day we were born. And it's one of the oldest, uh, you know, things that we have been dealing with. Initially, it was very much uh, done by the parents for the children. And then it became the noblemen and the kinsmen for the heirs. And most of the other people would educate their children and the families. And this went on for many, many years, maybe thousands of years. Then came in the Industrial Revolution, where it became very important for us to put an order into education and we put in the order. We started to decide, we means educators, started to decide what the learners must learn. And we removed the freedom of learning from the learner. We started defining vocations. We started defining professions. We started defining the degrees that would allow them to get into that profession. As we move forward, you had the advent of the information technology, another great leveler, you know, and industry 4.0 happened. Oh, yeah. With industry 4.0, everything got leveled out. The oh, online, the new technology started testing the legacy education. And as a result of it, there were a lot of threats. They were the MOOCs that actually threatened to impact the legacy education. But somehow they did not exist. I mean, somehow they were not successful, primarily because of the regulations and the legacy that withheld the ongoing education that was going on. Yeah, then comes the pandemic, COVID-19. 1.2 billion students go offline. They can't go to school. So the schools go online to get to the students. 68% of the students are actually not going to school today. And the rhythm of education is completely broken. There are questions on how this will pan out in the future. There are questions what will happen to the students who are going through the transition right now. All these questions we're going to throw up in this evening, in this session. I would now like to uh, bring in... Um, Dilip to introduce himself and say a few words about this pandemic and the impact. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here in distinguished company. Uh, I'm the, uh, my name is Dilip Thakur. I'm the editor of Education World, uh, established in uh, 1999. Uh, we are India's number one education magazine, perhaps Asia's number one education magazine. Earlier, I was the founder editor of Business India and Business World, which were India's uh, first two business magazines. So uh, I felt that, uh, you know, one of the reasons why India is not doing well, somewhat belatedly, I discovered that it's because our education system, which goes to the root of everything, wasn't good. So this is why I ventured into uh, education uh, journalism. All right. Yes. And what are your views about the pandemic? Are there any few few words that you would like to say? Yes, I think this pandemic uh, is, uh, is is uh, has severely disrupted education, and uh, but at the same time, it's presented us, you know, an opportunity to make a radical shift in the type of education that uh, we've been uh, delivering to uh, to our children. As you as you, I'm sure all of you are aware, India's education system is one of the most backward in the world. And uh, 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 the vast majority of our fellow citizens are not at all well educated. About 300 million of them are illiterate. So uh, obviously the education system thus far has failed. And uh, this, uh, they say, you should never waste a crisis. So we should convert into an opportunity mm -hmm. to, to really transform Indian education. So while it's a disruptor, it's also an opportunity. Fantastic. Professor Sharma, your introduction and a few words on the pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Sanjay Ji, uh, for inviting me and uh, Vijay Bhumi University, which is doing this uh, exercise. 
I am Professor Chandra Bhushan Sharma. I teach at the School of Education, Indira Gandhi National Open University. Uh, I had the fortune of chairing the National Institute of Open Schooling uh, between uh, April uh, 2015 and 2020. My discipline is education, so I teach, I train teachers, I do distance education, I work in the area of media in education, and also policy planning in education. So um, I have been on various co national committees and commissions which have recommended uh, things to the government, like the review of the National Council for Teacher Education, the Distance Education Council of India Bill, and similar other uh, policy matters where I had the fortune of being there. As far as uh, COVID-19 is concerned, I believe uh, good Corona came. I'm mm -hmm. happy we had COVID-19. <laughs> we learned that spoon feeding in education would not work. We have been saying for a long time, learning to learn. And that was the mission of schools. We never did it. And it's lifelong education. How do we do that without training the students, without training teachers? No school teacher ever did distance education. No teacher ever practiced with online education. This is the time. 99%, that's the UNESCO report. 99% teaching learning is being done online today. How did the teachers learn now? How did they switch over? And they are doing it very well. We may have difference of opinion about duration and the way they are teaching, but they're all doing it. Within a week, they learned it. This is the future. This is going to be the new normal. So I believe uh, technology in education, online education, rather blended education will have to be there and that will be the normal. As a distance educator, I'll say, thank God we had Corona. <laughs> Uma, over to you. What? Uma, I think you're on mute. You're on mute. Hi, I am Uma. I'm an IIT Delhi alumnus. Uh, uh, I have uh, mastered in material sciences, work with fundamental research before uh, plunging into education. I have been in education for the last two decades and uh, I'm an educator, uh, teacher trainer and a curriculum writer. And above all, I think I'm a homeschool parent. I have, I have homeschooled my child through K-12. And uh, through this K uh, COVID, I think uh, we are having those uh, uh, unending uh, board exams going on. So, you know, we are just trying to catch up. So I think today I will be talking about uh, COVID and its impact on learning at home, you know, like uh, uh, just uh, adding to what uh, Sanjay had spoken uh, about the evolution of education. So I think uh, education has to a very great extent has been uh, learning at home. That's how I look at it. Uh, the pre-industrial era uh, was a, sm a small community learnings where skills were nurtured and to a very great extent parent were the people or the people who were the skill enables for the children. Then came the industrial era where schools emerged. But I think uh, a child would have spent about six hours in school. I think the rest of the learning happened at home. So I feel mm -hmm. over 60% learning actually happened at home. And we as parents and mentors have guided our children. So if you look at it, uh, uh, the uh, next era, I think, is uh, as, we, as Sanjay was sharing about, the information era is going to be about distance learning is going to be about learning through home. Why? Because I feel uh, the kind of skills we need to nurture in children, uh, the 21st century skill framework which it talks about, is all about things which school is, has to take time to really evolve. We are talking about learning to making children learn, making children collaborate. So I think this is the reason why we stepped on to home school for my child, because we didn't want a child to be a consumer and we wanted her to be a creator because we are stepping into a world of creators. Fundamentally, what COVID I think has done is uh, it has actually pre and uh, is forcing us to simulate the future learning. Uh, I, I feel uh, when you step learning at home, uh, possibly there are two things which would happen is you will possibly uh, try to bundle the world resources available over the world, all around the world, and make learning much more richer for your children. So I feel uh, 
we as parents have to actually capitalize on this covid situation and uh, strengthen ourselves maybe double up our capacities to learn how to enable learning at home because i think it's not going to be 100% offline and zero online and sport you know the new normal would be a blended uh, education with some offline and some online depending upon the kind of uh, 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 courses and the kind of skill areas which we will want our children to embark on so i feel uh, it's a great opportunity uh, to learn and possibly prepone the entire world of education on to going into an online mode and uh, make learning much more richer you know? so i feel learning at home that's what i would say it's a school at home and not home school you know because it's not 100% parent need not be involved you could have remote so resources which can be used we can we can have various kind of courses coursera everything blended into the home i think your child will be much more richer school becomes just one part of your remote learning mode so i i think covid has actually opened up umpteen opportunities for homeschoolers like us so i am pretty happy about that yeah. fantastic uma i think we have two proponents of corona virus here one is professor sharma <laughs> and the other is uma i think it'll be an interesting discussion over to you aditya uh good evening everyone first of all thank you mr sanjay for uh, inviting me to be on this panel and putting this panel together i think it's like you said it's very interesting uh we have people from the policy making field from education and homeschooling and i think uh, so i am uh, the ceo of ascend international school uh, we're a school in mumbai we started in 2012 and we're an international baccalaureate or an ib school and i think the perspective i want to bring in is uh, just to look at the switch that Uh, all the teachers have made i mean we've spoken of how it's long lasting but also the time i want to talk about is that uh, from the time the lockdown started to when teachers went on went to teach online it was a very short amount of time for everyone to adjust to that and i think uh, i've actually heard this analogy from someone as that it's almost for us at least as a school it felt like uh, we were flying an airplane and building that same airplane at the same time while we were in the air <laughs> so so that that's sort of my uh, sort of one sentence uh, analogy for uh, how we got into this covid situation and i think uh, having said that it's been an interesting journey for us i think uh, all online models i think uh, all online models of education are looking at how they can be more student centered how we actually engage students online i think that's where uh, this is going to go like both the i mean i think everyone's been saying before me as well is that it will be a blended model it it won't be a purely brick and mortar model i think a lot of the tools we've learned in this online model right now will be used when we go back to school in the school building to a physical classroom space as well and i think that's been the biggest takeaway for us from the situation that there were lots of tools available we have now gotten familiarized with them and using them and we'll continue to use them when we go back to a, a physical schooling environment as well so i still have hope that we will go back to a physical schooling environment but i think the tools we've learned right now will uh, definitely help us all i think uh, move ahead and make learning more engaging for all of our students thank you thank you very much aditya so now we did a small poll around here and we got some very interesting results so we asked the question can online education replace legacy education and 80% have said no 40% have said yes so there is some there are yet some people who believe that you know online education would uh, replace legacy education so now over this period we're going to question ourselves on capital education how that has been impacted the progression of a person from I mean, for a student from k12 into higher education the whole impact of online and everything so here we go first question to entire audience and i would like to keep it very informal so if you want to just state just raise your finger and i mean raise your hand and i would uh, and come in okay so the first question is the same question that we asked on the poll is online education here to stay go Can ahead it means online education is Are it here it, to stay is online education here to stay the question oh. is that Certainly. I think I think uh, nobody should grab that question uh, before me. I must answer <laughs> that. I have done that for 33 years, and I believe online education is the only answer. We have been telling the world, you have to be independent learners. Look, when we start our schooling, <laughs> and people ask us, what would you like to become in life? we say we would like to become a doctor and engineer and by the time we pass our school we go on to become mechanical engineer and by the time we pass the iit or the engineering college we go to do finance or computer science and things like that so professions change much faster than disciplines 
so i think there is no option but to go online because we cannot bring back the students to classroom every two years to change their profession the professions are going to change every two to three years you will have to change your job so you have to make your learners independent learners and that cannot happen without distance education without online education so i believe right from school age we have to make our learners independent learners who would learn on their own we only have to train them on learning to learn so i believe online education is the only answer as as the new professions come the new disciplines come they should be able to switch over faster so i think we we were late in doing this but now we have tasted it returning where as tds has go over absolutely so learning to learn is the key word and i think that has been identified as one of the essential skills given by the world economic forum for future of jobs so that is one of the key things and i think the earlier we teach them the better it is i think uh, i think just the question if i would like let me so, tell it yeah yeah go ahead atik go ahead no, i think i think uh, learning to i think loving to learn i think is really important i think i think liking what you do and i think a love yeah. for learning is what will keep students driven even outside of school or even beyond school i think so i think that should be i mean one of the things that we as educators look at is loving to learn is uh, giving kids that sort of uh, uh, love for learning and that they can take online offline wherever they go i think sanjay if you can just add on sanjay yeah, sure. uh, i sure. mean just adding on to what mr sharma was speaking about online education increases my access you know so actually i am not just uh, limiting to my own geography i think I, now the reach entire world is within my reach so i am able to really pick up courses all over the world before i pass out 12th grade and i am actually richer in that sense so i think online education has to be viewed with a much broader perspective absolutely yeah but since you to speak about the reach since you speak about the reach the question that comes from the audience and also resonates very well with me the question is that there is a marginalized world outside which may not have access to the internet or to the computer what about that yeah i've got an answer shall i yeah yeah sure dilip yeah i think you know we've been saying in education world firstly the if you want to, it is very important that everyone should get an education in this country it should be universal unfortunately we we've, we've been uh, i've been a very strong advocate of more spending on public education you know way back in 1966 the kotari commission said you should spend 6% uh, of your gdp on education right uh, 70 years later it's not to happen we spend is still only spending 3% uh, of the gdp on education on public education and uh, the the great tragedy of india is that the government has allowed the uh, government school system to be uh, you know totally run down because they are inadequately funded and at the same time they are increasingly interfering in private education and and throwing a spanner in the works there really the most important thing that needs to be done is that all of us in fact people in education must insist that uh, the, the spending on education must increase to uh, 6% a minimum of 6% of gdp and uh, it's not true that you know we don't have the government doesn't have the finances if you see the april issue of education world we've given you a whole calculus on how to raise 8.09 lakh crores for investment in education if we do that for only 2 years we can completely change the landscape of uh, public education in this country simultaneously i i think in the private sector where the education is far, far superior than it is in the to the government sector the uh, government should have a hands off policy and this has also been recommended by the kasturi rangan uh, committee and i think uh, the real importance is for government to focus on improving its own schools and let letting the private schools uh, uh, grow on their own uh, in under the tutelage of expert educators fantastic so again coming back to the topic so of yes, so can i add something to this question sure go ahead uh, i don't agree with most of the people who say india doesn't spend 6% on education we go by the calculation of the west how much does the government pay on education their ed school education has is completely free 
here a school education is not free more nearly 50% of the population Correct. pays for this education in private schools one two calculate all the money that is spent on higher education by parents and by parents sending their children abroad for education so if you calculate the total expenditure on education by government or parents or guardians it will come to more than 6% as a nation we spend more than that now second issue is about digital divide uh, that was your original question i believe when we talk of it, technology in education we only think of online and computer based education in education the most important technology that we use in developing world is radio we have great examples from sri lanka nepal bangladesh jharkhand in india ranchi and recently we have done with the diploma in elementary education in india so don't forget most appropriate technologies radio television community radio and similar other technologies so i believe the most appropriate technology for the most appropriate learners we have to do that india has 50 years of experience and experiment in technology based education just just that we keep forgetting in india because we don't have continuity in school education and continuity in um, maintaining our database but sir radio uh, radio is not interactive no no, no no who told you no how we have you, great experiment wait a minute charkhand we trained 80000 teachers it was completely two way and we were regularly interacting it is just that we try to make it one way we have community radio we have um, interactive radio we, and uh, the national institute of open schooling does it every day we have we have a two way two way audio and two way two way uh, audio one way video as well on the television so just exactly dilip ji you have raised the question the government has failed in informing the people the stakeholders about the technology is available we like to spend on the technology but we do not like to share with people that this is available please use it yeah it's news to me point taken <laughs> now so okay i i do understand that there is internet radio as well which can be made uh, interactive dilip that is what is i think he's talking about but uh, going forward again i think it's important like one question that comes to my mind if government schools were so dilapidated prime you know prior to covid so what happened during the covid to the students who were going to government schools has anybody got an answer to that what happened to those students you know all the top end of the society is talking about online education computers but that's at the level of probably the middle class and above and for those people who are accessing the government school what is their fate if somebody has an input i would love to hear it they'll go I, from I bad to worse i think they should take this question yeah i think they'll go from bad to worse because uh, uh, really it's a, it's very iniquitous and this is why i was saying you need to spend more and sir i want i agree with you that we are spending more than 6% all told but we want the government itself to spend 6% yeah i don't think you should be <laughs> <laughs> so then it will go to over 10% is really what we need correct yeah that was a very clever statement there i agree with that completely uma you wanted to add something yeah uh, i mean i work with some underprivileged schools so i know a humongous number of uh, underprivileged schools which uh, push corporates to really add on uh, uh, i mean various kinds of technology and push the entire school to go online okay so uh, i feel uh, it is not just about hooking on to technology and learning it's about how do we make sure we connect and disconnect and learn you know i think uh, distance learning need not be always through technology you can use various means as mr sharma was saying to, to learn so there are many so in fact i think the delhi government uh, within one week of whatever so we i work very closely with delhi government the entire gamut of uh, uh, schools have gone online and all the 10th 11th and 12th children have completely learned online so basically uh, i think it is about motivation of the institution the organization also to really move on you know stopping technology is not going to help you no know, like we are seeing some of the states actually stop technology it's like mm. you are 
not basically that is not enabling that's not an enabler and technology is not going to be also 24 hour hooking on to online so you know there are various ways in which we can do so obviously enabling tv i think that is one another channel which people are trying to use yeah it cannot be completely attractive but yeah what is the least one can do so uh, i feel there are some bunch of government schools and underprivileged schools which are doing very well with regard to uh, enabling education through and through the school uh, i mean during this covid situation so not everybody but yeah uh, pockets so that's some good news at least those people who who we thought were not getting uh, adequately uh, nurtured are are getting uh, what they deserved now coming back to online education i would like you to uh, share your views on the pros and the cons of online education so what do you think are the pros of, uh, of online education aditya since you are the young educator probably i would pass this question on to you so i think uh, for us i mean i can i, I can talk from our perspective for, for us one of the pros is that uh, in an online environment if you're delivering a lesson on a zoom kind of a platform or a web platform uh, the lesson has to be very engaging for the students so teachers had to design lessons that were engaging and stretching students uh, in, in a whole different way compared to a brick and mortar or an in school model so i think that was one of the biggest uh, benefits we saw the teachers who had become designers of curriculum and were able to design curriculum differently that was one of the biggest uh, pros for us in online learning i think the con like everyone's aware of i think uh, lots of parents are cognizant of how much technology they want to expose the students to as well or their kids to as well so that's the con that we saw is that trying to find that right balance of yes uh, some things can be done online and via technology but some things can be done even without technology as well so uh, i think uh, trying to find that balance is is one thing that we have been looking at and also uh, making lessons more engaging and more individualized or uh, and student centric i think are the pros uh, of online learning according to me fantastic so it's about engagement engagement seems to be the key word to you uma yes, exactly. what do you have to add can i take it up? yeah yeah sure yeah so i feel i mean in addition to what aditya was sharing i think one another great benefit of online education uh, is and i experienced it when i was doing the delhi government project is uh, basically use of resource if you have a wonderful resource he will be reaching out to millions of children you know mm. so i think uh, uh, paucity of great resources has been a challenge in some of our sectors possibly one good resource i can actually use it for many 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 children to learn so i think that's one extraordinary benefit of an online education i feel uh, and the con is possibly i think uh, the uh, misuse of the technology comes when the pedagogy is not really understood and planned you know you need to have a pre course completely designed you know it is not like your one on one lecturing which is happening so i think that's where the whole challenge is you know you cannot do the uh, knowledge sharing you know you have to have a complete pedagogy completely designed and everything available so that child is self directed and he uses it as in when i mean like for example when you do an online course i mean i have been uh, accessing many online courses and my daughter does it you go and pick it up at whatever time you want so it's available so as options all of our teachers are learning it they're just trying to uh, bring the school on to the online system so they need to design courses i think that's one thing if we can crack it then everything would become a positive you know yeah you know uh, can i just you know one of the greatest uh, ways to learn is self learning yeah. and uh, we are a great believer and really uh, looking back in my own life i I believe I'm an entirely self-learned uh, person <laughs> because I used libraries a lot when I was a student in London. They have an excellent library system, you know, and uh, therefore self-learning has been given a tremendous boost by the internet and the huge library that's available. I mean, you can access whatever you like, you can learn whatever you like, and I think uh, we have in, in the old days of uh, the Gurukul system also it was self-learning and peer-to-peer -peer learning with the teacher. intervening only when uh, required you know when uh, doubts and uh, questions have to be clarified if you can uh, the tremendous uh, opportunity it gives for self learning and to learn subjects you like and to learn with your peers is a great opportunity of the internet i think today and online learning see go ahead go ahead go ahead sir. see i i think there cannot be one size fits all for school education you have to be very very careful in higher education adult learners 
perhaps technology can play a major role but with children we need to be very very careful in the sense that they have to be taught within co taught to use technology they have, just as they learn alphabet they have, they do literacy they have to do technology literacy correct one correct. two a schooling is not just about transfer of content we don't call students to school just to transfer content it is learning to live together inclusiveness is the answer i think uma ji has been saying again and again my children have done home schooling i have been chairman of the open school i do not prefer open schooling distance more the schooling for children what is most important with the school says that your children learn to live with each other socialization the boys and the girls that is why see we switched over from single gender school to mixed schools we 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 closed down uh, blind schools the hearing impaired schools and brought all inclusion is the answer so i believe let us not be myopic about the issue of technology or online education that either or it's not binary opposition it has to be blended and right. especially for children it must be schooling they must come together that is why when uh, we were talking that schools must open whatever may be the method one class a day or 100 children a day but children must meet there so much tension i can share with you there so much tension between i mean amongst the children because they are not able to share with the peer group that sharing between the peer group some children do not share with parents they share with their friends and their friends go and tell their parents who in turn inform the parents of the children so it is important that we have schooling not just technology so home schooling is good for some children for some reason but not all children all the time one and technology should be only as a panacea that whenever required we can use it but not 100% fantastic sir i'll interject here and i think i i have four great takeaways first is personalized learning which is what uh, online learning can do second is self facing learning so that is great i can learn if i at my pace third is i can learn what i want to learn at my convenience so this is i hear all of you saying that and i'm trying to uh, just stipulate it and the fourth thing said is to be existential okay to know how to live with others how to allow others to live you know so that would be the uh, i think the summary of what we've spoken about now i come back to online teaching so people are confusing online teaching with video teaching i think online teaching has been in this country and the world for the last decade like dilip brought in the google the internet i think that's all being online the only thing that's changed in this pandemic is that it's gone from face to face te- teaching to online i think online resources have made our teaching very rich i would like to pose a question to you that and we have also put this on the poll would you differentiate a credential obtained from online teaching or home teaching against a credential obtained from face to face teaching so what i'm saying is would you say an nios certificate is lower in quality than a cbse or icse certificate or an online degree is lower in quality when compared to a So that's the question to the panel. Please go ahead and uh, take a shot at it. Can I take it? Sure, Uma. Yeah, I think Ladies this is something which we keep pondering day in and day out. You know, uh, I mean, uh, uh, thought is uh, uh, I don't think it's anymore. Okay, uh, fundamentally because while people might have a lot of views, like how we are talking about the this is uh, this is a. a, a a change which possibly might set in and come in uh, uh, in a few years now from now but i feel if i open coursera and take a course you know i have known so many children taking it it's just that people do not know this is available such a fundamental uh, change a child would experience you will have courses which are so highly valuable in terms of learning so i feel when i look at an nios curriculum 
I surely, I mean, I, I'm not somebody who wants to debate, but it's a debate which we had when we moved into homeschooling. This NIOS as a curriculum is so open, so flexible. Similarly, if you look at Cambridge, I don't see that with CBSE. So fundamentally, you are doing things for the sake of it. If I do an NIOS, you're actually a self-learned. You know, so obviously the uh, and uh, we have gone through an admission process now. The child is not completed it to us, but she has gone through her undergrad applications. All of it happened because of her self-directed approach. You know, so there will be many courses which uh, might be great in terms of certification, but I think it's the learning which matters a lot. So if you have courses which take you to very good learning. I don't think uh, the degree really matters. I mean, I don't think we should give too much of it. But yeah, the change would take time. But I as a person, because I think this even in highly educated parents are also uh, doubting. So obviously, we are talking about uh, grassroots level. There will be a lot of questions. So, but I think it's the course. You know, if I want to, I will put the course era open into many children. And actually, they're all learning it. You know, So uh, they are very valuable in terms of skills. So, so let, I mean, me, let, me, let me just. One moment, sir. There's a very interesting poll that we asked. So we asked, is an online degree equivalent to a conventional degree? And yeah. uh, I've been watching the answers come through on the poll. So initially, it was 40% of the people thought that, you know, uh, conventional degrees, I mean, uh, online degrees are worse than the conventional degree. And then when Uma started to speak, it changed to 50-50. Now I see it's 52 47 <laughs> So I think people are more or less agreeing with what uh, uh, you all are resonating. Now, please go ahead. Please go ahead, sir. Uh, um, I, I resisted by answering this question. I wanted somebody else to answer because I have chaired the National Institute of Open Schooling. And I have heard from many, many people say, is your board recognized? Is your yes. certificate recognized? And that was very, very embarrassing for me in 2015. I can definitely say 2020, uh, this nation doesn't ask that question anymore. And I wanted Uma to answer this because she has got her children do homeschooling. See, it's both are equivalent. The open schooling certificate and the CBSE, we are the two national boards. We are the only two national boards. No other board is a government of India board. So as far as uh, government uh, recognition is concerned, both are identical. The NIOS syllabus, syllabus is harder than the CBSE ah. because every time we were asked, is it recognized, we'll say, look at the books, look at our question paper. In fact, we had to put up a committee to compare and come up with a report saying NIOS question is more difficult than the CBSE. Absolutely. Having said that, Having said that, I because it's a great panel and people are going to hear. If you lose it, I think we just lost him. Yeah. At at the absolutely okay. wrong time. But the, <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Hello. Okay, so, continue. But the gender. Uh, Mr. Sharma was talking about, so if you look at an NIOS and a CBSC, an NIOS or a Cambridge child is actually taking during his boards, his ninth and 10th curriculum together. But while well, a CBSC is just doing a small little 10th grade. So it is so minuscule and there is no choice in most of the question papers in NIOS. So the kind of outcomes are much more better than a CBSC. This is my experience and I've gone through it. So I completely endorse what he's saying, you know. No, but the general, general, so think, see, no. open school Open school always has a tougher syllabus, tougher uh, curriculum because we have to prove to the society that we are identical. But then I will pose a question to the traditional institution and the society. We depend upon the traditional schools. They do not take us very seriously. And our examination slips, our curriculum transaction slips because the traditional schools do not take us seriously. They take upon themselves to teach our children who are non-formal. They take upon to provide a good assessment platform, but they don't do. I think once we are rigorous, the open schooling is rigorous, it can prove to be a better system except for the overall development of a child. Yeah. The general perception, the general perception is
And even I must admit, I myself have a bias that if, if a person has been gone to the, uh, oh, has been schooled at home or hasn't gone to school and has done online education, they don't have a fully rounded education because uh, they're <laughs> unlikely to have good socialization and communication skills. They yeah. probably don't play games and sports. Mm. And, uh, you know, and uh, their teamwork is uh, likely to be uh, looking at it from the viewpoint of an employer. I would give a greater weightage to a person who's been to a conventional school. Of course, I'm educated that uh, academically, perhaps there's a parity. But uh, generally speaking, I think there's a, it's a valid prejudice that a person who's not uh, gone out into uh, and uh, in that interacted with his peers, as you said, Professor Sharma, that's a very valuable skill, you know. And what are known today as life skills. Yeah, and, uh, my, experience, yeah. my experience has been different in this, okay? I okay. think uh, uh, when you are in a school, uh, I mean, I, I am also a school educationist, so I don't have anything anti. I'm walking both the uh, lanes parallelly, okay? But when you are in a school, you are basically learning to socialize with a certain age group. When you are out of the school and you're at school at home, you actually have an ability to go across the age groups. And I have experienced it with my own. My child became more socialized when she got into homeschool. So it is not that, but it is about the parents and the ecosystem, how it enables. So not everybody is capable of doing that. So that's where the challenge is. Okay, the second is uh, I think I think, uh, admissions. And uh, I'm here talking about Sharma, Mr. Sharma. There is a huge change in the way the world is looking at NIOS. So if people are looking at it, I think it's more accepted. And it's actually given a lot of respect. I have gone through it now this year. So I know it. Like you know, So uh, it is not that it's completely undervalued anymore. Aditya, would you Puma like to had taken a pound of flesh. I must say, five years has been terrible as chairman in IOS. Mm -hmm. I, I, nobody would know what agonies I have gone through. Minister, yeah. member of parliament, bureaucrats, everybody wants his or her child and they themselves. I know of 10 members of parliament who are my students sitting in the parliament and how did they want to pass the exam? Because they feel that the open school is going to be a problem. Easier. Yeah. Aditya, what, if, what would you like to add, being a hard yeah, so I think, school operator? Yeah, so I I think a lot comes down to the approach. Like Mr. Thakur was saying that, uh, and, and I think uh, Professor Uma was saying that, because her approach is to be able to give access to her with different ages, different age groups outside, it comes down to the initiative of the person doing it or the family doing it. Like Professor Sharma said, there are some people who just want to clear the exam and some people would want to actually go out and make full use of it. So I think both online, uh, either online system or in school system, I think the approach is what's most important. What approach is being taken by the person doing it, also by the institution delivering it, both of those. I think they are what make all the difference. If the online system, uh, the approach of the online system is to be able to educate students, give a rigorous program and engage them and stretch them, it can definitely be at par with a regular brick and mortar schooling system. But if it's not that, there could be a lot of loopholes in it. Like Mr. Thakur was saying, there's a lot of uh, prejudice that people have about online learning, which I think is fair to some extent. Uh, so yes, I, I would definitely urge more towards side of brick and mortar schooling and how it adds value and benefit. And it leaves less to chance and less to initiative of the person who's doing it or the family that's engaging in it. So let me let me get down to the genesis of open schooling. And I'm sure Professor Sharma can correct me if I go wrong. So in my view, this is my view. I'm not talking about red knowledge, but about how I imagine the open schooling would have come. So schooling was all about, you know, putting people in a straight jacket into a curriculum that you followed like a train. Yeah. And there were some people who didn't believe in it. They wanted something more open. They wanted people to be more liberated in terms of making choices yeah. of learning. So I heard Dilip mention about being a self learner. I did mention Uma about that open schooling creates the motivation for learning. And to some extent, I do agree with Uma that, you know, in the brick and mortar, I think we are in the brick and mortar schooling. We are uh, trained to be, uh, you know, targeting our entire effort towards a particular objective, which is clearing exam and learning as the process is forgotten. But the question here to the panel is, can open schooling be brought into the brick and mortar? Why they should be taught in silo? Why can't they be brought into the same school with the new technologies? I think the concept of open schooling can easily be blended with the concept of the traditional schooling. Your opinion on that? Yeah, I think, uh, see, that is the trend today. And that is what I said should be blended learning. 
neither completely online nor completely classroom based there has to be a mix some part of the curriculum which should which we should leave to the teacher that is very very important let the decision makers the administrators not decide this will be taught online or that would be done in the classroom let the teacher decide which portion of the curriculum she would like to take online and which portion she would like to take in the classroom one two there has to be a inclusion of technology we have to live with technology we have to keep learning through technology and we must be taught that so i believe in the school sector technology must come in just as we have done it I, i am one of the members of the national uh, committee for uh, technology enhanced education and the honorable president of india gave awarded me for that so we have planned the whole system and we said higher education 20% of the total curriculum load one can take through online education why not in the school education so we have not done proper thinking for the schooling we need to do this and we need to bring in online learning dele uh, what is your view that's this is uh, on the blended learning as uh, professor sharma says this is one of the most exciting development that's happened and it's really the whole benefit of this uh, corona virus uh, crisis and blended learning as you said in your opening remarks is the way to go it's here to stay and i think uh, getting the mix right is really uh, is going to enrich education tremendously so it's a very good development and i think uh, it's it's the way forward so conventionally let me bring in another point here conventionally we are very used to streaming our students we would like after 10 put them into science <laughs> commerce arts are we believers are we believers of that might have worked it now but is it going to work in the future a student may want to do physics drama probably yeah. english all together why should the teacher stop them or the educator stop them from doing should we not liberate the curriculum is the question yeah uh, can i take it yeah I yeah think- sure yeah uh, so i think uh, this was one of the primary reasons where uh, learning at home helps no because uh, it does not uh, limit you know there is a freedom of curriculum freedom of what you want to learn because ultimately you want children to be passionate about learning you know you don't want to learn because you have to do exams and you don't like some subjects no so just leave it like that so i think uh, the most beautiful part of uh, learning at home or blending uh, both online and offline is basically i think uh, if you look at an nios uh, or even a cambridge you know it allows you uh, um, a uh, lot of subjects which are of your choice you know it is not like it, the school doesn't limit i am sure in cbse it happens but schools do limit because of the paucity of resources or whatever reason you know there are n number of uh, paperwork one has to do if you are a dance uh, uh, if you want to career career in dance they will not allow it if you want a career in sports they will not allow it it's just maths physics chemistry so there are some limitations which happens with infrastructural costs i feel cost is going to be, be a big factor in making all okay I think one of I the most that has is... already happened. Yes, that uh, the National Institute of well, Open Schooling was well, front runner. Well, it it did away with that. I mean, you can choose any subject, and from last year, the CBSC has mm-hmm. also done it. You can take previously you had to take mathematics with physics, chemistry. Now that's no more a compulsion. Um, it has been done away with. I believe all boards have... will have to do that. so i think it will it... take time to really get it executed on the ground you know so uh, you know uh, it is not so easy you know not like you I, uh, pick I, up I, like I, agree. I agree with you completely uma because when you're transitioning from higher high school to university the university system yet believes that an engineer must come from science except in our university which we are starting which is vijay bhumi university we would take even a commerce graduate as an input and he can choose to graduate as an engineer so basically again the question comes is that if you have to liberate the curriculum what are the challenges that are being posed to the entire education system and at what level should we liberate it should we liberate it at the primary school level should we liberate it at the secondary school level at the high school level or at the university level is the question that i would like you guys to. can i can i start with this one yeah that's sure mm-hmm. 
So I think uh, I think one of the whole aims for us to start the, the school that we began is to look at how the education model can be changed and can be done differently. Like I said, we based our whole model around student-centered learning. And just to go back one step to the previous question, uh, the international baccalaureate does allow students to take yeah. various options of subjects. I think I mean one of the reasons we selected or we wanted to be an IB school is because it allows students to have a flexibility to choose across a plethora of subjects, not just a few, and it doesn't limit students into those boxes or silos of being either arts, commerce, or science. So from that point of view, I think uh, education right from primary to middle school to high school or primary and secondary education, both or all the way up, uh, need a huge overhaul in terms of, I think, perspective. And I think we need to have some, uh, I think, building perspective in our teachers and educators is one of the biggest challenges that we have is that if we have the teachers with the right uh, perspective and the right mindset, uh, they can work in an online medium, they can work in an offline medium and can make content or whatever they're doing engaging for the students. So I think uh, one of the biggest key pieces for any school or for any education system is the educators who are behind it. So giving them the right perspective and giving them the right uh, training is what I would say is, is, is what was required and is a big need of the hour currently. Aditya, that's a fantastic point that the educators themselves need to be educated about homeschooling, open schooling and liberal yes. schooling. I think there are a lot of people. All the so we did a poll here asking a question, should we disallow screening at a K-12 level? 38% said we should disallow and 61% said we should screen. So yet majority of the people believe that we should be screening people, but that's the conventional uh, thought process. So now let me come and ask you a very, very fundamental question. How would you differentiate traditional schooling from open schooling from home schooling? Can we actually from, put a definition to each one of those? I think that, uh, that there should not be a definition. I mean, one uh, for the previous question, let me buzz in. See, the whole concept of a university is autonomy, which we have done away with. What you are saying that in your Vijay Bhumi University, you are going to admit commerce students and giving them, give, give them the opportunity to do engineering if they are interested and they can prove themselves, they have competencies. That is the concept of an university. Go back and refer to the idea of a university. But we have been making rules and norms and regulations which have completely killed autonomy of the institution. What you are talking of, uh, Sanjay ji, is the ideal situation and that should be. The autonomy of the academic council of a university should never be tampered with. The autonomy of the principal of a high school should never be compromised. Let the principal manage. We never let the principal of the school manage. So first is make institutions autonomy, put good people there and let them decide. Now, the second issue that you are now uh, raising is that traditional schooling, open schooling, home schooling or whatever. The whole concept is to create an ideal human being. Whether we can achieve that in a classroom, in a, in a campus-based schooling or through open schooling. Open schooling, in spite of Umaji being a great supporter, Good is here, and I've been chairman, but I don't. That has its limitations. We provide open schooling to those who are otherwise not able to attend a, a, a campus based school. Being in a campus based school is very, very important. But say, I have met my student like uh, Mary Com. Mary Com is our graduate, uh, Shekhar Dhawan is our graduate. Dhoni at one point was our student and so many parliamentarians because they are, he or she have to be in parliament, cannot attend the school, so must study from open school. <laughs> For such people, open schooling is very appropriate, but don't make it the mainstream schooling. It is important that children live together, they fight with each other, they know, they understand how human beings behave in a society. Right. Shall I think? Sure. I think, uh, I mean, I look at it uh, from the perspective that uh, uh, one of the educational goals is to pursue excellence. Uh, you know, so I feel whatever learning helps you pursue excellence. To me, excellence is what uh, I need to learn for the future. So I, I feel if a school is enabling it, let it. If a home at school is enabling it, let it. 
or if it's something which is much beyond it, let it. So it has to be a blend of all of it. Now, to me, I mean, I don't think school, uh, like what uh, we were listening, uh, we have all been self-learners. We went to school to socialize. Let us be very clear about it. We have learned one or two things from great teachers, but everything you learned on your own because you found resources, you had a home where that was enabled. So somewhere we think going to school is about everything. Yes, socio-emotional nurturing can happen only at 101 face to face. Rest of it, if you have great teachers who have exciting you, yes, resources matter. But half the world is going to tuitions. They go from one school to another school. So, I mean, there is no end to it. So I feel how do you enable a child to be scaffolded so that he's taking it more by himself that is what a role of a school is so i feel role of a school is to help children learn what to learn and how to learn so uh, i mean as of now the school has to go through transformation so while i am not a proponent of an open school but i find it as an excellent source to basically make a children passionate about learning so that's why i built up open school you know otherwise i would have gone to cambridge or whatever but i think it has an opportunity. So learning is not going to be, I mean, let us be very clear. The future is going to change with the economics of whatever we are seeing in the world around infrastructure cost is going to be huge. So if you are talking about getting great learning at 50% of the cost, why will I not benefit? It is going to bring down my travel cost. It is going to bring down my all overhead costs. Now, if I'm going to get a great, great learning out of uh, whatever, I have not spent too much of money on my child except for many things. So why not grab it? Why not grab these opportunities? So, so I look at it as school at home. I'm not even calling myself as a homeschool proponent. Okay, School at home to me is parent becomes a resource. I connect on to the world to get resource. School becomes a resource possibly for some, taxi like schools, whatever we talk about. And then possibly you also have other sources becoming a resource. So I feel it has to be a combination of all of things and blend it in a right format and make children learn with passion. So it's about pursue excellence. The problem with school is it is equal to marks. It is equal to the subject learning. The box ends, your syllabus ends. You're just closed. So let's not close learning. So okay. what will give you an opportunity of chasing it? I think that is what... No, I... no, Sanjay, can I just yes. put in a... You know, it's very important to also have a blend of school learning and home learning. Absolutely. What, what children are taught really in schools is government propaganda. Yeah. You need a counter-curriculum at home. Right. And that is best done at the dinner table. You know, uh, what you read in the school about the greatness of India and what a great country <laughs> and how everything is wonderful and beautiful is not true. So it's very important for homeschooling, even for children who go to conventional schools, to have a counter curriculum and learning at home. So that's where a, a blend of that is necessary. Otherwise, you would come out thinking India is the greatest country in the world, doesn't need any reform. Whereas, in <laughs> fact, it requires uh, many reforms. So it's important okay, so, for a counter curriculum. Fantastic. So let me, you know, my learnings from this. I would define homeschooling is learning at home. Just like now we have a new culture, work from home, you have a you have something called learning Learn from home. And open schooling is more about liberty in learning, what I want to learn, when I want to learn, how I want to learn. And the traditional schooling is all that we know we have gone through. But the question arises now with so much of knowledge floating around, so many type of moves, courses already invading your homes. You have the Baijus, you have the upgrades, you have the Vedantus of the world, you have the coaching classes hammering inside. Can you stop home homeschooling in any way? So I think the ecosystem in a way is force blending all kinds of uh, exactly. schooling in any case. And I think, you know, and finally, the way I look at it, tomorrow we won't be able to fight this force. It will all become schooling, open will go, home will go, and school will go. You know, that's what. My view. How many of you agree on that? Yes, we agree. For sure. For sure. Learning, learning, all all the time. All learning all the time. <laughs> Absolutely. And now with this concept of work from home, okay, we would need a new curriculum, right? There is, I mean, we all are hoping that COVID-19 will one day just disappear. Let's take the assumption that just like Spanish flu, it does it and it takes its own time to, for us to get immunized to, the, to this. So there has to be something that we need to do in our curriculum to make changes, to prepare our students to live in the new time. I would like to hear your views on what are those changes? Like, would work from home need a new curriculum? Like, we've been teaching people yeah. wear tie coat and go to office. 
and work from home. You have people wearing coat tie and shorts underneath, you know, and sitting with the camera and talking. Are we going to teach students that that's the new uniform of office, or what is it? So let me hear you. Yeah, I like to take it up. Uh, I think work from home uh, to a very great extent is being self-directed and self-disciplined. So I think that's the one of the biggest thing which a school never does as on today. It is teacher directed and teacher disciplined. So I'm not talking about all schools, but mostly we are talking about the general. So, so I think self-directedness is something which we need to add on. Uh, Self-learning is what we need to add on. Ability to collaborate even if you're socially distanced. You know, ability to collaborate and connect with uh, the world around, even if you're socially distanced. I think uh, that's something which we need to add on. And I feel allowing children to explore what he wants to learn, at least a high school and above, you know, not limiting into the subjects and not saying these are the only things you need to learn. Because obviously we are talking about work from home has requirements of certain skills. I feel learning at home, whatever schools are making as of now, have to do those modifications. So it's not zooming in into the classroom and watching the child at all times. Leave him alone. Just give instructions. Just leave them. Let them go study on their own and come back. I mean, the challenge is why the world is all saying that children are all hooked on to because teacher is completely watching. I mean, I heard uh, Aditya talking about it. Yeah, just give, an ins give instruction and let children explore. Trust them. I think the first exactly. thing is trust. So if you can Absolutely. do that, so I feel self exactly. is something we need. I think this issue has three aspects to it. One is the curriculum part. The second is the transaction part. And the third is the assessment and uh, certification part. As far as curriculum is concerned, I think we are at a juncture where we should see a new curriculum framework by the end of the year and new textbooks by the next uh, March, April. When the next session starts, we should have a new set of textbooks coming in. I think that's imminent. Second is transaction. You will definitely see change in transaction pattern. We had never experienced a situation like this. The schools never thought of it. But next year session, this year we have done, come up with uh, emergency schedule of schooling. Uh, the NCRT has come up with it. For, from next year, perhaps, that will become a part of it, mainstay. The third and the most challenging would be assessment, evaluation, and certification. We did never thought of online uh, examination, or uh, on-demand examination as the mainstay, perhaps we can see that. So all the three, I think you will see great change. I have great hope and as, I mean, I have also some information that we are working on the national curriculum framework. We are working on the new textbooks, which will come by April and we'll have a different transaction pattern as a blended mode, classroom as well as online and assessment by next year, 2021-22. Uh, exam, we'll have a new pattern of evaluation as well. Fantastic. Aditya, why don't you explain what you have been doing? I think uh, a lot of it comes down to, as, Dr. as Prof. Suma was saying, I think it comes to self-discipline. I think we're really expecting kids or trusting kids with the work we're giving them to do and trusting them to deliver that work as well. I think that's what uh, work from home is for for everyone. Uh, a task is assigned to an employee, you expect them to do it even if they're at home or in the middle of something else, you're expecting them to do that task and deliver it back to you. So I think education in general will become more about what uh, students are, the process of learning and also the product as well at the end. As to what are they giving back or what are they delivering at the end of it, which I think comes back to assessment as well. I think ass assessment on an online platform is also really important as to seeing how much has been retained by the students or has been applied by the students, all of that. So I think uh, in terms of online curriculum and changes because of this work from home, I think uh, the way we assess kids, the way we talk to them and trusting students. I think that's one of the biggest changes that we as a school have taken is that we trust students to do what we're telling them to do and what we're asking them to do. And I think that's what I think all organizations are trying to do with their employees is that this is the work that has to be done. I'm not going to keep watching over you or watching over your shoulder to see what they're doing. This is a deliverable. This is a timeline. Organize yourself and come back to us with any questions you have. So it will really reflect a lot of the work environments that are already existing, maybe in some organizations in India and even outside of India. But it's more about self-discipline, trying to set methods of assessment which are uh, which are effective and are able to be done remotely, and for students to uh, for teachers to trust students on what they're uh, being assigned to do. 
Fantastic. Dilip, would you like to add, would, are you hearing some innovative models being developed by schools, etc., that you would like yeah, to share? Yeah, yeah, I have some. What What do you say about uh, uh, what Aditya said about assessment and uh, evaluation is very important. Really, the most important change we need in Indian education is in the examination system. You know, mm-hmm. Currently, what, what they uh, value, the examiner's value, is not something the university values. And there's a big dissonance, you know. And when children go into uh, uh, from school to you know colleges, they're really not prepared for college to take full advantage of higher education. As a higher education uh, a person in higher education, you must have noticed that by yes. because uh, there has to be greater uh, connectivity between schools, colleges, and universities, and ultimately industry. Now, in our exa- in our curriculum framing and all, industry is not at all involved. And uh, I think that's a grave mistake. And I think even uh, even school curriculums, higher education, there has to be a mix of all this. And then you create a curriculum. I think they do that all over Europe. Uh, that uh, you must mm-hmm. get involved. So ultimately, the student who gradu- passes through the system is ready to for the workplace. And I think that's very important. Uh, and that change has is fundamental to education reform. So I'm going to raise a very out of the box question here. You know, we have all decided. I don't know. For so many years, we have believed that a student needs to do 10 standard, then 12 standard, and then four year graduation. Why? Why can't he do it in eight years? Why can't he do it in 18 years? Yeah. Why? Why are we dictating it? Do you think that paradigm needs to be also, you know, thought about and changed uh, going forward? Let this because let's look at life. Right? Life is the life expectancy has become 100 years now. So we can't expect people to graduate at 25 and have the knowledge lasting them for 75 years. Things are very dynamic, changing every day. So people have to be continuous learners. It cannot be, you know, just stop learning and move ahead. Maybe like in the earlier days it happened. So from that perspective, do you think there needs to be a relook at this, you know, 12 year, 14 year, 16 year education pattern? See, I will. Uh, um when we have the right to education and the RTE Act said that there should be a class of 35 students to one teacher and everybody co- said where is the data, where is the research on 1 is to 35 is the ideal, right? Very difficult to answer your question, why should an 8 year old not be allowed to write the 12th class exam, the board, 12th board? But Look at the literature for 3,000 years, right from the Vedas. Why was a six-year-old child sent to a Gurukul and not before that? I think through experience, we have internalized this and we have sort of understood six year to 18 year plus minus two, three years. Some may be very bright who can pass or complete the curriculum of a 12 year in eight years or nine years. But then you need to have a norm for the nation. So you have made it as nobody less than 18 must pass the 12. And before 17 years, you cannot write the exam. But if you really ask me or any educationist for the data and evidence, I don't think we have really done that research to say, why can a 12 year old not write the 12th class or 12th board? But it's globally the same. We will have to do a thorough research on that. Uh, what will happen to the mental status of a child? Now, I would believe uh, this norm should, is perhaps justified in the sense every parent would like the child to pass the 12th class in eight years. And there would be tremendous pressure on the children. So to perhaps control the parents, we have said no less than 18 years should be allowed to write the 12th class exam. It's not more for the children than for the parents. We are more worried about, let me tell you, as somebody who has really worked with the school education, we are more worried and pestered by the parents than by the children. <laughs> Our so problem are the parents and not the children. <laughs> Correct. Good observation. Yes. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting point. Dilip, Aditya, you want to say anything on this? So we are seeing more child prodigies these days. We are seeing entrepreneurs at the age of 28, 27, billionaires at the age of 28. And uh, 
and you know things are changing so why are we sticking on to 16 year i leave that question for all you to think i think we have been into this discussion one hour nine minutes and short over by nine minutes there are some questions and suggestions that i would like to just talk about from the audience which i would like to run so there was one which has been you know which i thought is something that we should discuss it was raised saying that why are we talking about institutions why should the focus should be on pedagogy and a shift from focus on knowledge to understanding and application of knowledge it's not about the institution i think that's a, if anybody wants to add anything to that i think I mean, institutions have a very important role to play uh, without institution you will not be able to do it it is very easy to say why institution why a school why college i don't think that is the right way we need to have institutions for the common for the general for the majority some may be different so uh, we are not talking of a system for the aberration for the extremely bright or for the extremely poor or uh, slow learners there has to be a system for most because uh, children are average we need to have a system for them if you say why in have institution where would they go what would happen to them every father mother would not have the understanding globally in, in spite of the fact that india has majority first generation learners globally parents do not have idea about what education is about so you cannot leave the children of the world in the hands of parents to decide what they want to do with the parent you might have given birth you are their guardian but you are not really the master it has to be the teachers it has to be those who are trained to look after the children who would decide about children and not exactly the parents i'm i'm, I'm making a very strong statement your children are not only your responsibility your children are national responsibility and this responsibility of the teachers let them decide don't decide for them so true there's one very interesting point also made by somebody which is saying that you know i think this is a very valid point saying that there is a larger susceptibility of abuse of education if you go online i think that's a risk so would you want to express your views on that well uh, in education Uma, would you like to take that question no i wanted to say in education world we have consistently been asked asked to ban all pornographic sites uh, beaming into india it's very according to me that's a very important thing that we need to do because when you have a population which is 300 million people are illiterate and you know and you have a very young population uh, i i don't think uh, there's any argument really for allowing pornography and which leads to child pornography and the stuff to be allowed to be beamed into india okay sharma ji you want to add something yes i mean i, I would think uh, too much liberal approach as far as young children are concerned is not justified why do you have late night programs like big boss why do you make it uh, late night because you understand that there is something which children should not be watching similarly some people say why not i mean I, i'm good uh, that uh, dilip ji has raised this question uh, some parents would come and some adults would come and say that why not let it be there and then we must trust our children no there is a certain age till which we have to train them once they are trained then we can trust them so uh, i think there is something like a decision making by the parents by the society by the nation and you must have responsible parents responsible society responsible government and very important is very good training of the teachers which we have not done the national council for teacher education as a body which prepare teachers has done a very shabby job in the last 30 years we must prepare good teachers and then leave the children in the hands of the teacher and let them decide okay i uh, feel i feel uh, talking to the teachers and educating children you know become pretty crucial 
because uh, we can stop everything around us but that's not the end i think we have to prepare our children because there is going to be irrespective of whether you you are watching an online course or getting into a small game there are various ways in which uh, children are tapped on nowadays online and all children are aware of it so uh, depending on what age group we are talking about till a certain age parent has to be a part of the whole exercise and possibly exactly. i think educating the teachers to really so that's one thing we need to be a part of your curriculum if you're going online educating and i think talking very openly in circle times with children uh, i mean being able to talk to the children and that's where the bigger challenge teachers face is they cannot do sex education or talk about the effects of pornography and what you should watch you know, all the adolescent children have to be spoken to especially higher school high school so we need to enable both you know monitor the back end and also monitor children with uh, maturity i think that's So, so I think one 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 of the things we we've done is we've actually do a digital citizenship uh, course with all of our students when you begin. So we actually talk about what is it uh, what does it mean to be a good digital citizen when you are using your device and how we're trusting you with your device, and also having consequences for 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 different things for students. I mean, like you said, uh, I mean at every age level there's a different uh, requirement for every age level. But again, it comes back to trusting the students, giving them the expectations, saying this is what we expect from you. and uh, laying down the boundaries for the students i, I, I think it, a lot comes down to that i think in this online uh, model and i think just coming back to the one of the previous points we were all talking about i actually know some of the students personally who are actually post their 12th are thinking of taking a gap year and are thinking of working are thinking of doing internships are thinking of doing projects that are interesting to them and that is actually allowing them to choose a better career path beyond that point because only when you work and go out and spend some time in the industry uh, post your 12th grade or whichever age you can and you actually go and experience i mean i want to be a journalist for example and i go and do an internship at say education world for that matter i will mm -hmm. know whether i like that or not and then decide what i want to do further on so i personally think uh, i mean the whole uh, idea of having finishing so and so by 12th grade and graduation by so and so age is completely obsolete even today today i mean i, I know some students personally like i said who are going to take a gap year post their 12th and they don't know what they're going to do after that but all they know is they're going to do specific projects that are interesting to them in in different spheres of work or doing internships at different organizations which are interesting to them and i think that i think is something that we really uh, i i am really fortunate to know these people and i am be in touch with such people who are uh, taking thoughtful decisions of their future and i think that's what uh, will be the road ahead for everyone is to decide what path they want to decide based on experiences that they have work experiences i think i think what the also the audience wanted to know is that uh, with the online revolution with people misuse the online system to provide malicious degrees and i think the answer my answer to that would be that you know the online is a new phenomena and every time phenomena has happened whether there has been films whether there has been audio there has always been a misuse and abuse and it has taken our society a while to come up with the rules and regulations to control it so we all felt Obviously. that you know with uh, online banking we lose our money but today 90 a lot of transactions are happening yeah. online the trust is going exactly. to develop slowly i think we need to give it time and the society to work around i think we have probably done one hour 17 minutes so i would like to <laughs> give each one of you two minutes to come up with your closing comments before i can close this session so again i'll start with seniority dilip you go first Okay, you know it's been a very interesting uh, session. I think we've covered a lot of ground, and uh, actually, I must thank you also for moderating it well. In that you've not allowed us any of us to make long speeches, and it's been very interactive. <laughs> That's a good word. Like uh, we recommend, it's interactive, and it's therefore it's been quite stimulating. Uh, that's thank you very much. Yes, it's been thank a you, good, a good you. question. Thank you. Well, I, uh, I think Professor Sharma, it's your turn now. Thank you very much, Sanjay, for organizing this discussion. I think we have uh, raised many issues which uh, the common people, the policymakers, the government must look into and start debate. The most important thing is that people are most uh, unconcerned about uh, these issues, and this should give them the opportunity to start thinking about these and raising these issues. Online education for my child or not? whether schooling should be compulsory like that that what uh, right to education means similarly uh, curriculum what sort of curriculum my child is studying how the curriculum is being transacted all these issues are of crucial importance to each individual's life about which parents are least concerned so this is very very important discussion thank you very much for 
taking up this discussion which will ultimately result into more discussion in the society and that is important that we start debating and asking questions to the government why is there no professional body for school education like the university grants commission who manages who decides on school education people never ask i think your your program will raise such issues which will have to be answered by the government the policy makers and perhaps teach parents would be better informed thank you very much thank you yes sir uma your turn now yeah i think uh, this was a great uh, interaction i'm sure many people would have benefited out of this uh, one thought uh, which i had as a closing mark uh, could be that uh, this is for all the educators and the parents who are there uh, uh, in the program is possibly i think we all have to look at it in a very positive sense and build our capacities uh because this is going to stay for a while you know we are not uh, wanting to say whether it's going to end or we will move on if this cons cons continues for a while what is it that which you need to do so possible interactions with right kind of people especially for parents because i am sure working from home learning from home is must be putting a lot of load on to them the right kind of interaction and exploring this is an opportunity to help your children learn much more than what ideally they would have learned in this same uh, time in a different scenario i think that's what you need to look at and not get unnecessarily bogged down by the changes which are happening around i think that's possibly should be an outcome of this session that's what i feel yeah thank you uma uh, aditya your turn now yes yeah, so i think for me i think uh, personally i learned a lot about how homeschooling can be different and what my preconceived notions were about homeschooling so i think i'm really grateful for that and also the open curriculum i had heard again uh, by all of us have preconceived notions about both of these things and i personally learned a lot about both of these aspects and how uh, they can actually enrich any student forget uh, the students who are on home schooling or doing open curriculum and i think from my perspective uh, i think currently with the situation we're facing with covid-19 uh, i think in any distressing situation or in any sort of uh, world changing situation uh, you can either accept it as negative and crib about it and sort of talk saying that this is what's happening us oh my god we are stuck here or whatever it may be but i think for education it's time to pivot and uh, become something much bigger much greater and especially for indian education it is such a great opportunity for us to pivot and make it into something that's a lot more blended sort of format that we spoke of today and i think the advent of uh, 4g and technology even in uh, the remotest parts of the country i think where the access to education is definitely increasing and i think this opportunity is a great chance for us to like i said pivot into uh, leveraging that and making education accessible to a larger audience uh, through an online platform Thank you Aditya I think this has been a great learning session for me as well starting from the fact that there are some of us who believe and including me that this time that corona has created for us is like a pause in our life to reflect and make corrections into what were happening and all these discussions that have been happening though there has been there been are pretty all over but the fact remains is that we are thinking debating talking and discussing it was normally only the privilege of those who could get on television channels now we have our own channels and you know this democratic this democratizing of the media itself is going to continue and also change education thank you for teaching me about what's open schooling what's open schooling bringing issues like trust which are so important not only trust uh, between children and parents but children and uh, teachers children and society children and the country i think that's very important to build on to go forward and i would like to conclude this by saying one thing i think education has to move on it's a cliche but education has to move on from being the sage on the stage to start becoming the guide for the side thank you very much and look forward to engaging with you with early sometime later bye bye good night thank you have bye. a great thank day. you namaskar bye bye thank you bye, -bye. thanks